Amen. Good, good, good morning. Um, I, it was, uh, I don't know, maybe three weeks ago, and uh, maybe four, a pastor looked at me, and uh, we were actually having a meeting over some coffee, and he said, you're going to preach on December 4th. <laughs> I thought, who are you looking at? <laughs> you're looking at me? <laughs> and um, he said, yeah, you. I said, okay, um, I'll do it. And um, he said, are you nervous? I said, yes. <laughs> but, uh, but I gather together with you not to declare my message um, or to tell you my words, but we've gathered this morning to hear from God, uh, to hear from his word. And so that takes some of the pressure off of me, <laughs> um, but I am his messenger. And so uh, this morning we will um, begin a new series, and um, it's geared towards Christmas, and I've titled the sermon this morning, it's called A Christmas Plan, and um, we're going to look at God's plan for that first Christmas and how he started that first Christmas, and, um, but as I was thinking about naming this sermon, I was thinking about even us as we get ready for Christmas, and it's December finally, and um, some of us have been getting ready for Christmas long before December got here, um, even my family and I, uh, we had Christmas lights and Christmas decorations up before Thanksgiving got here, so um, we've been ready. But with, well, with Christmas um, comes a lot of planning and a lot of preparation, plans to be with family, even plans on what will get people, um, gifts that we'll be giving. Um, Lauren and I have talked a lot about the gifts that we'll be giving and what to get for so-and-so, and we've talked about how to spend the holidays, and all these plans that we're pr putting into place. Um, we've been planning, and, and really, my wife is more of a planner. Um, she likes to have the plans. If I was putting all the plans together, it would be maybe next week or, or the next, I'd start telling Lauren, hey, that we need to start planning and preparing. Um, I'm more of a play-it-by-ear kind of person, um, even a wing-it, um, just kind of the family I grew up in. We just we didn't make a whole lot of plans. We just kind of played everything by ear, really laid back. And Lauren likes to have everything um, scheduled and uh, put together. And so I promise I'm not winging this message this morning. Uh, I prepared for the message. But when it comes to Christmas planning, I'm definitely kind of a, hey, let's just play it by ear and see um, how things happen. My family's pretty laid back. They don't really care if we see them on Christmas. They just want to see us sometime. And so, um, but as I'm thinking about us planning, our I begin to think about how thankful I am that God didn't play the Christmas story by ear. He didn't wing it. Um, it was something that was well, well thought out. In fact, the whole Old Testament points us towards that moment that God would bring Jesus into the world. I mean, that's a plan. That's a good, well thought out plan. Before the foundations of the earth, God was preparing and planning and that's something that we can find hope in this morning. And we do find hope in that. Our God is not winging this. He's not playing it by ear. He has a plan. And so this morning I want us to look at this passage of Scripture that begins the plans of Jesus coming into the world. And the passage of Scripture that we will be in will be Luke chapter 1, verse 26. So if you would turn with me there, that would be great. And I'll read this whole section uh, verses 26 through 38. I'm going to read the whole passage, and then we'll walk through the scene that we have here in Luke. And so in verse 26, it says this. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph, of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying, and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus." He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. 
And Mary said to the angel, How will this be since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth, in her old age, has also conceived a son, and this in the sixth month with her, who was called barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me, let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. From her. What an amazing scene that we have here in Luke. The amazing scene where God is bringing Jesus into the world. And this is his plan that we look at. And so this morning, I want us to look at this passage of Scripture as one scene, and we'll kind of walk through the beginning, the middle, and the end, and we'll make some observations about this passage of Scripture. But my prayer is that we would realize that God not only had a plan for this first Christmas, God has a plan for each one of our lives. And I hope that we will find observations from this passage of Scripture that we can apply to our lives even today. And so let's look at these first couple verses here. In the sixth month, and that sixth month there, as we read earlier, that's the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy. If you read there um, before we get to that passage, we see that Elizabeth is bearing a son, and she will call him John. But in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed or engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. God sends this angel. This is his plan. He's setting up the scene. He's sending this angel to visit Mary. And up until this point, I think it's important for us to remember, to this point in history, um, Well, not to this point in history, but there has been a a, a moment of silence before we get to this angel being born. For 400 years, there hasn't been a prophecy. God hasn't spoken, right? And so there's been this moment of silence from the last book of the Old Testament, our last prophet of the Old Testament, to this moment when God is going to come onto the earth. And so there's this moment of silence. And how is God going to break the silence? What is his plan? It says that his plan is to send this angel to a town called Nazareth in Galilee to a virgin named Mary. I don't, I don't, I didn't know too much about Nazareth until I started studying, but we're talking about a small town, maybe 1,500, 2,000 people in this town. And Mary was maybe 13 years old, a young girl. And as I was reading this, I'm thinking about God's plan You know, one thing that comes to my mind is, God, what a small beginning. What a small beginning that you have. And the first observation that I make when I think about this little town of Nazareth and this little teenage girl, right, maybe 13, that God is going to choose to bring Jesus into the world, the first observation that I make is that God often uses small beginnings. God's plan often starts with small beginnings beginnings. I'll tell you the the picture that I get in my mind as I'm reading this when I was studying. My mom grew up in a little town called Arnett up in northwest Oklahoma, and there's a little town called Shattuck. And so as I'm reading this story, the middle picture that I get is this little town in western Oklahoma, and that Jesus, or that God would choose to send an angel there, and you think, God, it seems so small. It seems so tiny that you would start this grand plan of bringing Jesus into the world would start in a little town of Nazareth, right? That would start with this little girl that seems so small. And God's plans often start small. In fact, if you look over um, in the book of Mark, Mark chapter 4, Jesus says this to his disciples about his kingdom. And you may be familiar with this passage. Jesus says, he says in Mark 4, verse 30, he says, And he said, that's Jesus, With what can we compare the kingdom of God? Or what parable shall we use for it? It is like a grain of mustard seed, which when sown on the ground is the smallest of all seeds on the earth. Yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes larger than all the garden plants and puts out large branches so the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. 
God's plan often has small beginnings. He even tells his disciples, I'm sure his disciples are thinking, okay, Jesus, you're going to start your kingdom. There's 12 of us, there's you. It just seems kind of small. And what does Jesus tell them as encouragement? Jesus says the kingdom of God is like this mustard seed, right? This grain, this grain of a seed that when it's put in the ground, it grows into a tree that's larger than all the garden plants. I've read up to maybe 15 feet. Right? A mustard seed would grow into a tree that would be up to 15 feet. And he's trying to explain to them that I know this is a small beginning, but it will grow into something huge. And so we need to understand, even this Christmas and even in our life, that God's plan often starts with a small beginning. And we can't underestimate that small beginning. As we think about what God wants to accomplish in our nation, we may think, God, if you would just do something big in in maybe Washington, D.C. or something of that nature, then we could see revival in this nation, right? But what if if God's plan is much more humbler than that? What if God's plan to bring revival to this nation would start with maybe a couple of people that would choose to pray together before work, maybe on their lunch break, would say, let's commit to praying, Maybe a couple of students would say, hey, we will meet during our lunch or during tutorial and we'll begin to pray for our school. And through that prayer, maybe an office space or a school would be one to the Lord. Revival would start there and then all of a sudden would sweep um, across a community that would sweep across a state, that would sweep across a nation. Right, I think God's plan may be smaller than we expect. Maybe even for our families, we want revival to come to our family. God, if you would just do this big thing and show up in this big way, then my family would see revival in it. And maybe God's plan is is to start much smaller than that. Maybe with just you. Maybe with just me. If we would begin to just pray. That faith of a mustard seed, just that small beginning that we would begin to pray, and God would use something so small, something so simple to do such a big thing. You know why? Because in God's plan, in God's plan, It's about him receiving the glory. He tells Paul that my power is perfected in weakness. My power is perfected in weakness. You see, when I read this story about Jesus, God being, Jesus being born in Nazareth, I'm sitting here reading, God, that seems so anticlimactic, and God just kind of, I don't know if I can say hit me upside the face if I can say that on Sunday morning, I don't know. But it's almost like I was sitting here thinking, God, that seems so anticlimactic, and God's like, because it's not about Nazareth, and it's really not about Mary, it's about me. And that's the point, that I would receive the glory. So God is coming, he sends angel Gabriel to this town in Nazareth, to this virgin betrothed, engaged to a man whose name was Joseph, of the house of David. And then in verse 28 it says this, this is where it gets really good, right? It says, and he came to her. That's the angel in verse 28. And he came to her and said, greetings, O favored one. The Lord is with you. Greetings, O favored one. The Lord is with you. I think it's interesting that Luke just says the angel came to her. It's like, are there, were there trumpets? Did he just walk in the front door? Did he bust down the walls? I mean, what? He just says he came to her. It's like, it just seems so simple. You know, it's like, it's an angel. There had to have been light or something, right? It, would, it had to have been amazing. But it says this angel came to Mary, and it says, that he said, oh, favored one, the Lord is with you, which seems like such an awesome statement. Seems like such an awesome statement. But Mary's response is maybe a little different than we would anticipate. In verse 29, it says, but she, Mary, was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. So this angel appears, he just comes in, I don't know, I don't know if that's a house or if they're outside, I don't know. But the angel just comes to her and says, oh, favored one, the Lord is with you. And it says that she is afraid, she's troubled, and she's trying to figure out what does this mean? What does this mean that you say that I'm favored? Remember, sometimes I think we can read this book and think, oh man, miracles are happening all the time. Miracles are taking place all the time during, during Bible times, and so she should just be expecting it. But I can promise you that this was very unusual. Before we started, I said, remember, that God hasn't spoken in 400 years. There hasn't been a prophet in 400 years, and there hasn't been miracles longer, in, in longer than that. Hundreds of years have gone by. There hasn't been a miracle. There hasn't been a word from God. And so this would have been unusual for Mary. She would be trying to think, what does this mean? 
She's trying to discern what does this mean, right? Jesus is going to come on the scene, and we're going to see a lot of miracles begin to take place. But up to this point, it would have been very unusual. She wouldn't say, oh, yeah, this is what happened to so-and-so last month. Yeah, because all these miracles are taking place. No, she would have been confused. It says that she was troubled. I think it's interesting. As she's in the presence of holiness, there's this, this troubling um, this, this fear that comes upon her, this reverence for what is holy. Remember, the angel Gabriel has come from the presence of God. If you read back in Zechariah and Elizabeth, you find that the angel Gabriel has appeared to Zechariah and Elizabeth first, which our students should be familiar with, actually, we talked about that on Wednesday. But these, uh, this angel has come, a holy angel. Zechariah's response was the same way. He was terrified. Mary is terrified. She's scared. Doesn't know what this message is supposed to mean. And it really reminds me of Isaiah, right? We read Isaiah when he's in the presence of God, right? It's not, oh, yeah, I'm in the presence of God. This is awesome. God, wow, this is so cool. It, it says that his response was, woe is me, for I am ruined. He says that, woe is me, I am ruined, for I'm a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. Guys, the response, our response as sinful person in the midst of holiness should be this troubled reverence for God and his message. And I wonder even how we come into this room this morning if we realize as we enter into this time where we come into the presence of God, is there that reverence for God for us? For Mary, she's troubled. There's this holy being that's before her, and she's trying to figure out what does this mean. And then in verse 30, it says, And the angel said to her, again, he says, well, it doesn't say, do not be afraid again, but he repeats his message in verse 30. It says, he says, do not be afraid, for you have found favor with God. It says, do not be afraid. An angel, obviously very terrifying being, but the angel says, do not be afraid. You have found favor with God. So what does it mean? Well, I found this favor, so, okay, there's got to be more to the story, and there is. So how does God show his favor to Mary? This is what the angel explains. Mary, you found favor, and then in verse 31, And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom. There will be no end. Mary, you have found favor, the angel says, and you are bringing in the king. You're bringing the king into this world. That's how God's favor manifests itself for Mary. She's going to bring the king into the world. It's interesting that in this passage, Gabriel emphasizes the rule, the rule and reign of Jesus, that he will be the son of the Most High, he will have the throne of his father David, he will reign over his kingdom forever. What an amazing responsibility for Mary to bring in the Son of God, the Most High. That's amazing. But as amazing as that is, I can tell you that this morning, church, we are favored. We are favored. Because we get the opportunity to, to take this Jesus. Mary's bringing Jesus into the world, but we, we get to take Jesus around the world. The Great Commission. Jesus tells his disciples, you are to take this message around the world, and that's the task that has been given to us. God favors us in such a way that he would say, church, guess what your responsibility is? Guess what our responsibility is? We get to take this message around the world. You are favored in that way. And you may be asking yourself, well, Randy, I, where's, where's my holy angel that's going to come in and tell me this message? Where's, where's my angel? I I need my holy message, and may I lift my Bible up to you and say, we've got it. We've got the holy message. We have something maybe more, even more valuable than even what Mary received. A word from God, the very inspired word, every breath 
Every word that's in here is from the breath of God. Do we know that? Do we respond the same way that Mary responded to that holy angel? Do we respond to God's word as troubled and said, okay, God, whatever you want from me. God, this is your holy word. Every word in here was given to each one of us because we're favored. And I think sometimes we, we lose sight of, of that favor. And really the observation that I make here You know, sometimes we want to put Mary up on that pedestal, but the observation that I make here is not one of Mary. I think what's on display here is not just how great Mary is, which Mary is someone who we know very little about from just looking at that passage. We don't know a whole lot about her, but what I believe is on display when God says or sends his message, oh, favored one, what I believe is on display here, the observation that I see is that our God is gracious. Our God is gracious. He has given us this book. He's given us his holy word because he favors us. He's pouring his grace on us. And we have this book in different versions. And some of us have more than one copy even in our house. And I want you to understand that the access that we have to this book is God pouring out his grace on you. And I think, I think to an extent we've, we've maybe lost sight of just how blessed we are. And um, I've got a video clip that I would like to, to show you to help you see maybe what our proper response should be or maybe that response that we've lost. Um, there are people who don't have this book in their language. They, they, they don't have this book in their language, and there's a video clip that I want to show. It's just a few minutes, but I'm a, I'm a youth guy, and so somebody told me, even as you're praying, like, you got to have a video clip because you're a student <laughs> minister. So, so, um, so I've got a video clip that I want to show you. It's just a, a few minutes long, just a couple minutes, but it's a tribe. It's a group of people in Indonesia who are receiving Bibles, new, not even a, a, whole, a full Bible, just New Testaments. They're receiving New Testaments in their language for the first time. And I just want you to see their response. I want you to see the way they're responding to them being favored. Because they respond in a way where they know we are being favored. And I want us to realize just how favored we are this morning. And so if we can I'm <laughs> 
it's hard not to get overwhelmed even for me when I watch that. And here's what's interesting. There's multiple video clips that I've found of groups in China receiving Bibles for the first time in tears, this reverence. But one of the things I love about that little excerpt was in that pastor's prayer. He's comparing, he's holding those New Testaments. <laughs> I'm trying to cry. <laughs> ah, He's holding those New Testaments, and he's comparing it to when Simeon is holding Jesus in his arms, and he's saying the Holy Spirit promised that I wouldn't die until I held the Savior of the world. And he's, that pastor's hanging onto those Bibles, and he's saying that same promise has been filled to me. <laughs> the overwhelmingness is because I think it's conviction because I know how much I've taken for granted that I have four Bibles of my own. <laughs> and have I ever felt favored that God would choose to say, look what I've given you, this message to take around the world in multiple versions, and yet there's some people who are just wanting to have the New Testament in their own language. Church, we're favored this morning. Grace has been lavished upon us. What will we do with it? What will we do with God's favor? Well, what would Mary do? In verse 34, so that second observation was that we see God, God is gracious to us. And then in verse 34 it says, And Mary said to the angel, this is her response to that message, Mary said to the angel, How will this be since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. What is her response? She says, How is this supposed to happen? I'm a virgin. This doesn't make sense. This isn't possible, God. This isn't possible. And I wonder sometimes if when God gives us his message to take Jesus around the world, if we don't also respond and say, God, how is this supposed to work? Do you realize who I am? Do you know my limitations, right? You guys, the observation I make here is God's plans are often unexpected. And sometimes they don't make sense in our brains. And I can tell you, some of you know my testimony of even getting to this point some of you don't. I know the students, maybe you're tired of hearing it, and I won't tell the whole story. But you guys, it was 10 years ago this year that I came to this church for the first time. I remember I started getting plugged in as just a volunteer in the Student Life Center with students. I was in college. What I really wanted to be was a college football player, and that just wasn't going to happen. Um, <laughs> praise God. Um, but that's what I wanted to do, and God started moving me and getting me plugged into this church, and I remember being kind of in a dilemma where I was being asked to, to join this church and be plugged into the student ministry, but I remember being upstairs in that student life center. I grew up in a church in Arcadia, um, is where I've, where I've grown up, First Southern Baptist Church of Arcadia. And so when I came here and I saw the resources, I remember standing up in the student life center and, I remember center and thinking, God, how could you ever use me here? God, this doesn't make sense. I literally have nothing to offer. Why would, you, why would you ask me to join and be a part of this church? I'm just a college student, and it's almost like God said, that's the point. You have nothing to offer. You have nothing. I'm like, okay, God, I get it, okay? But I remember thinking, God, this doesn't make sense. But I remember taking a step of faith in my lack of knowledge, saying, okay, God, if this is where you want me to be, then I will, I will come and be a part of this church, and I will invest in the lives of students, and God, you do with it what you will. And to see what God has done in a life that is just full of weakness, you guys, it's, it's almost overwhelming. It's almost overwhelming. The first job that I had, I remember I started working with um, the students in the Student Life Center, just volunteering, 
And, um, and I got a job here at the church trimming the hedges and pulling weeds out of the parking lot, working with Don Cobbs. If any of you guys remember who Don Cobbs was, it was me and Don, and we were out there. He was on his ride on lawnmower, and I was trimming the hedges. And I remember the first time I went to trim a hedge thinking, I've never trimmed a hedge before. <laughs> I don't even know how to do this. <laughs> you know what I mean? But I just started trimming. And so eventually I said, hey, how about you just do the youth all the time, okay? No more <laughs> trimming the... No, but... Uh, <laughs> But I remember thinking, God, what is your plan? And to think that God could take this weak vessel and, and bring me to a point where now I would stand here on Sunday morning and be proclaiming the message of God. I'm, I'm overwhelmed, to be honest. And the glory belongs to God completely, completely. Because I was willing to say, okay, God, this isn't my plan. This is yours. And I give my life over to you. It's interesting because Mary says, how can this be? And what is the comfort that the angel offers? It says, the angel answered her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. That's the same encouragement for us this morning, is it not? That the Holy Spirit will come upon us? that the Holy Spirit would move us and direct us and that the shadow of God would overshadow us, that we would hide ourselves behind the cross. Guys, for those of you, I believe that God is tugging on your hearts or he's giving you a message and he's challenging you, I need you to do this for me. I need you to talk to this person. I need you to make this decision. And it's unclear or it's uncertain. I can tell you that maybe how God is planning to work in your life, but will you know that God wants to give you the power of the Holy Spirit? The power of the Holy Spirit to speak through you and that you would be hidden behind the cross. It's about, it's not about your intelligence or your capabilities, but about your willingness and the power of the Holy Spirit. And then in verse 36, it says, and behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son, and this is the sixth month with her. Who, has call, who was called barren, for nothing will be impossible with God. So not only with the Holy Spirit, but hey, you're not the only one who this is happening to. You may feel like I would step out, but I can tell you the Holy Spirit is working through other people. You're not alone. That's why we're the church. <laughs> we come together to find encouragement. You're not alone taking a stand for Christ. Right? Consider your relative Elizabeth. Right? And at the end of the day, what's the next observation? This is earth shattering, but nothing is impossible for God. According to his will, as we align ourselves with God's plan, nothing is impossible for God. And I can tell you that there are some, I know that in this room, even right now, there are some adults who taught me in middle school and high school that are literally in this room, and they can tell you, yep, nothing's impossible for God, because we would have never thought in a million years <laughs> either, right? So for you, middle school teachers and high school teachers that are here, this is God saying, I told you I'm real, right? I told you I'm real. Nothing is impossible for God. And may we find encouragement in that. Nothing is impossible for God. How can it be that we would be talking here in Edmond, Oklahoma, year 2016? We would be talking about a baby born a baby born over 2,000 years ago in a small little town called Nazareth. How is that possible? God. Nothing is impossible with God, with his message. And then we see Mary's response. And we'll begin to close with this. In verse 38, And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. So here is the, here's the question for us this morning. God's plan, small beginnings, often small beginnings, he is so gracious to us. The question is how will we respond to that? How would Mary respond to this message and she responds with humble submission. Humble submission to God. I am the Lord's servant. Let it be done to me according to what you said. 
Now, is she, is she saying that because she has it all figured out? I highly doubt it, because <laughs> God hasn't even given her the full story yet. She doesn't have it all figured out. What keeps us from humbly submitting to God? Is it because you're waiting to say, well, when I have it all figured out, for right now there's some things that just don't connect, some financial things, some different things that just that doesn't make sense right now, but whenever it does make sense, then, then I'm going to submit. It'll be humble, it'll all submit. Guys, where's the faith in that? Mary does not submit because she has it all figured out in this moment. She is going to carry a child out of, out of wedlock as a virgin. She doesn't have it all figured out. It's humble submission and faith. How will we respond to that word? That word that God has given us to take his message around the world. She doesn't have it all figured out. And she's also not saying, have it done to me, I'm your servant. She's also not saying it because it's convenient. You guys, because it's not convenient for Mary. If you know anything about this story, she's going to begin to carry a baby, and Joseph even decides, before he knows what all, is, what all is going on here, Joseph even decides to divorce her secretly. But he's thinking, I can't marry somebody like this, somebody who's pregnant out of wedlock, something that she could actually be put to death for. It's not convenient, and God's plan will not be convenient. So if you're also sitting here thinking, well, I would submit, but I don't have it all figured out, and it's really just not the right time, believe it or not, if you can believe that. What if Mary, she's engaged, and I know this betrothal process was much different than we know engagement, but she's engaged, she's getting ready for a marriage, right? Maybe she's got her plan, this dream wedding, right? All these things that are going to be so great. And somebody comes to her and says, you're going to have a baby outside of wedlock can't be convenient. But God, maybe, maybe we should just wait. Maybe if we just wait a little bit longer, it would be better timing then. And maybe you're here thinking, now's not the right time, especially not this morning, because I have, oh my goodness, I have so much stuff going on in my life right now. This morning is not the right time, and I definitely don't have it figured out. To respond to your message, guys, it won't be convenient. In fact, when I joined the church and started working with the student ministry, I came to a point where, and some of you may know my story, but I was trying to play college football. I actually came to a point where I had to figure out, am I going to try to do the football thing or am I going to live for you? And I decided that living for God would probably be the better thing since I got hurt and I wasn't getting to play. So I was like, okay, forget that, all right? But there'll be some things that it's not convenient, right? It's not convenient. But will we, will we respond in humble submission? And so I close even saying this. We talked about God and this plan for Christmas. He's bringing Jesus into the world. Jesus would come into the world, live a perfect life, die on the cross for your sins, for my sins. Be put in a tomb, and then he would rise again on the third day, conquering death, giving us salvation. What an amazing story. And here's what's great. That story is for you. And here's what's great. God's not winging it this morning. And he's not playing it by ear. When he created you, you are his workmanship. He created you for a purpose. And this plan to save you from your sin and those things that hold us back, he thought about you before the world began. And he has a plan for you. You may think, gosh, <laughs> You may think that this morning God maybe created you and you're just here to go do your own thing and whatever happens, happens, but I can promise you that's not how God sees it. God has a purpose and a plan. The question this morning is how will you respond? What is it that God is laying on your heart? What is it that God desires to do in you that maybe you've been hesitant to respond to? Is it salvation this morning? giving your life to God in humble submission, saying, God, I don't have it all figured out, and this definitely isn't convenient, but my life belongs to you? How will we respond? And this is what I will challenge you with. Three points of application. Be open to God's call. This morning, would you be open to God's call? Even the smallest beginnings. Could it be just, <laughs> just praying to God? Be open to God's call this morning. Realize that God is gracious. Just know as you leave here, you are favored, that God brought you in this room this morning, and just the fact that you have been able to hear this message 
of salvation in this room with such freedom is God's favor on you. He's pouring out his grace. And I don't know how much longer it will be offered because we don't know the time of the day when Jesus will come back to this earth. But his grace is being poured out on each one of us right now. And I hope that we would realize that, that we would know that. So realize God's graciousness and be prepared for the unexpected. I never thought in a million years that I would stand on this stage and proclaim the gospel. And honestly, if God, when he was drawing me 10 years ago to be a part of this church, if he would have told me, Randy, I need you to join. Someday you're going to preach up there. I would have said, I'm definitely not joining now. (laughs) You're crazy, right? Be prepared for the unexpected. It is a journey that is full of hope and joy. Don't let the enemy tell you that it's not. Because there is an enemy that wants to tell you, don't do that Jesus thing. Don't join that church. Be involved in the world. Guys, respond in humble submission this morning to God and his message and to his grace. And let him work in your life in an amazing way. I'm going to pray for us, and we're going to have a time of invitation. And during this time, I tell the students this a lot, because I think sometimes we forget this time of invitation, it's for you. Students, it's for you. This isn't about going through the routine of invitation, because we always do it. It's a time for the church to respond to God. That's what this time is meant for, us to respond in whatever way God would be leading you. And there will be pastors down front. We'll be here to pray with you. But this is time for us in the presence of God, to respond to him. So let me pray for us, and uh, we'll respond. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, I thank you so much for this morning, God. God, that you would take your message and that you would use even somebody like me, God, in the midst of all my weaknesses. Lord, may your power be made perfect, and I pray that that would be the prayer in the heart of everybody that's in this room this morning. God, that they would come forward or they would sit in their pew right now and all they would be thinking is, God, let my weakness be on display for your glory. And Lord, I do pray that for every individual in here, God, that they would respond humbly, humble submission to your plan. As Mary heard the news that she would bring in the Savior of the world, God, Humble submission, I am your servant. And God, I pray this morning that we as a whole church, God, imagine if every single one of us in this room would say, I am your servant, what you could do. But God, I know that you are a God of small beginnings, so God, I pray for just one. Lord, that would respond and say, I am your servant. Have it be done to me according to your will, God, whatever it may be. So God, let us respond in humble submission to you, our God, our King, our Lord. And we pray and ask all these things in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen.